what I find is I write faster in pseudo write because it's like I'm a trapeze artist and that's the safety net. So if you suffer from blank page-itis, any kind of anxiety whatsoever about your writing session, you get into pseudo write, you start writing. If you get stuck, it's just a click button away to get some input, to get some creative juices, so to speak, on tap that you can go, oh, I don't like that. But you know what? That just gave me two more ideas. Let me go ahead and, and, and put those in. So it's like performance art with a safety net underneath for writing. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 284 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. Today's episode, I have an interview with Elizabeth Ann West. Now, Elizabeth calls herself a Jane of all trades, mistress to none. She's the author of 12 novels and 11 novellas, 22 of which are story variations of Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice. A lover of all things geeky, Elizabeth is always looking for new technology to learn and master. And she shares some of that, specifically her experiences with AI and the AI writing platform Pseudorite, as well as her historical Jane Austen fan fiction writing with us in today's episode. And that's coming up later in the episode. But first, let's hear a word about this episode's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices is a platform that authors can use to get their audiobooks out into the global market with distribution to more than 43 retail and library platforms, including Spotify and including Chirp, which is owned by BookBub. With Findaway Voices, you can set your own prices. With Findaway Voices, you can find narrators at their marketplace, or you can allow Findaway Voices project manager team to work with you to find a professional narrator from their suite of thousands of narrators around the world. You can have it your way. You can control it your way with Findaway Voices. Findaway Voices just recently launched spotify download codes which i've been playing with and i love the fact that you can set your own price with findaway i've also on recently uh, speaking of chirp as i mentioned earlier i have a chirp deal featured deal coming out for my bundle one of my bundles of, of books which is a bundle of fears and frights which is Fear and Longing in Los Angeles and Fright Night's Big City. I did a two-book bundle because of the longer story arc that takes place between these two standalone novels. And and that's coming out January 24th. I am so excited to get another Chirp deal. The one I had in January 2022 was phenomenal. And I'm hoping even if this one does half as well as uh, that first one I did, it will do exceptionally well and help me earn back Much of the money that I've invested in the series so far. Speaking of audiobooks, I do have the read by professional narrators version of Lover's Moon Up. So I have the professional version read by Sarah Sempino and Scott Overton. And there's also the read by the author version by Julie Strauss and Mark Leslie. Because again, you have choice. You have control with Find Away Voices. If you want to see how you can leverage audiobooks as an indie author... You can check out Findaway Voices over at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. And now, comments from recent episodes. So, for episode 283, doing LSB, laughter, stretch, and breathe, with Amy S. Peel, this comment came in on Twitter from Edwin Downward. Edwin said, The latest Stark Reflections episode has me thinking again about how lifelong breathing issues make taking a deep breath problematic. A genuine deep breath will result in what can only be described as dizzy spells. Very annoying. And I thank you for sharing that, Edwin, and also apologize. I In the last episode, in my reflection, I, I asked listeners to 
take a deep breath. And, and I was doing that out of, you know, compassion for reminding you to just uh, take a break and pause and just um, feel a bit of a refreshment. Now, I still don't know, and, and, and I, I need to look into this. So for people who can't take deep breaths, is there a meditative process that can help? Um, so if you uh, are a listener and you're familiar, uh, like Edwin, with, uh, and Edwin, feel free uh, to let me know this, but if there are things that work in the same way that a deep breath can be cleansing and refreshing, please let me know. You can uh, comment over on uh, any of the episodes at Stark Reflections. I say you can email me, mark at marklesley.ca, because I would love to, because Edwin, I'm sure that if, if that's something that you suffer from, and you're not able to take those deep breaths because it's going to cause more issues. I'm sure that there are other listeners out there that can benefit from it. So if you're familiar with that, please let me know and I will share that in a future episode. Now some other comments uh, came in uh, from Patreon. Now I posted something for uh, uh, patrons uh, last week. It was uh, Brandon Sanderson's uh, latest annual message to his readers. So what I did is I, I read a section of that uh, because I, I've heard that you know my page, some of my patrons really like <laughs> the uh, opportunity to read something online, like an article everyone's talking about. You know, give it to them in audio so they can uh, you know digest it. And then of course I couldn't help but reflect on it as I do. And this comment came in from Stanley, and and I'm sharing these comments by the way because I think uh, they will benefit the entire listening community. So Stanley B. Trice said, thanks for this message from Brandon Sanderson and mostly about your encouraging comments. I've read some of Mr. Sanderson's shorter works and he is an excellent author. I like how he steers new readers to his works so they will read what they will mostly like. I'm also looking forward to AI voice for audio, although the real thing would be great because of cost. If more authors are posting and people are reading and listening more in other platforms, it will create the competition against Amazon. Excellent, excellent point, Stanley. And, I, and I'm glad you picked that up from Brandon's article and, and the reflection. But yeah, the whole the whole idea of AI voice for audio is, is creating more content. When you create more content, there's probably going to be more people that enjoy that content. When you have more people that enjoy that content, there's more opportunity for authors like us. To, to get into that space. I mean, it also, you know, cost-wise gets us into the space so people who only listen can discover us and then, uh, you know, potentially even people who can't afford it. I was talking to Dan Wood recently for the, the Self-Publishing Insiders at draft to digital and it was something we recorded earlier today, December 29th, 2022. And and, and Dan reminded us, that, yeah, there's there's... Uh, affordability, you know, for libraries, for consumers as as well. If if AI can help make that more affordable or even more accessible, then that's a great thing. So thank you for that comment, Stanley. And on that uh, same post over at Patreon, Kay Booth said, Mark, I didn't realize we could do AI audio through D2D. And did you say it's free? How do I do this? Please let me know. I tried Google Play and was frustrated. How can I do this through my favorite aggregator? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Kate, for that comment. And so the it's done through draft to digital It's actually Apple. Uh, Apple launched this, and uh, this is something that Apple has partnered with draft to digital for. So what happens is, uh, even if you are an Apple author, you can go through <laughs> draft to digital to uh, upload uh, the book. So what happens is you have the audiobook, and uh, that's what Apple is using to uh, and then you pick the voice uh, that you want and it's very limited selection and very limited genres right now that are available and then they go through that entire process so yes it's through draft to digital in partnership with apple uh, and and that's an interesting new thing that'll probably open up and expand as as time goes on because with a tool like this the ai is going to learn and it's going to get better and 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 everything is going to get better so i will include links to uh, uh, links to those pl places where you can learn more about the Apple Books digital voice narration as well. And I'll even include a link to uh, Brandon Sanderson's uh, State of the Sanderson for 2022, where he, he takes a really interesting stand uh, 
with Audible, which which I found uh, really interesting. So uh, thank you for the question, Kay, because when you ask that question, it's helping me help other writers who probably also have that question. So you can leave comments uh, for me over at any episode of starkreflections.ca. You can also email me, mark at markleslie.ca. Of course, you know, patrons leaving comments over um, over at the posts on Patreon as well. And if it's something that can be shared publicly, um, that's usually pretty clear <laughs> when it's something private. And, and again, I can anonymize your comments if you prefer. And I usually, I usually check uh, with people on those things, especially if it's something pretty personable, uh, personal, and, and they don't want to share. So that's it for the comments. I'm just going to jump into a brief personal update. So as the year's winding down, uh, 2022, it's December 29th, as I said before, uh, the day that I am recording this, I am just going through. So Julie Strauss and I, in, in the writing of Hex in the City, we, we've taken a little bit of a break. She actually had some family um, from out of town, and she was focusing on uh, family, which is very healthy, very, very good. So was I. I wasn't focusing so much because I, I didn't take any time off. I, I went right back into work with Draft to Digital right after the, the short Christmas break. But I have been spending my mornings going back to the manuscript. We've got about 65,000 words in the first draft. And just going back in and really digging, like really doing like line edits of the manuscript. Um, and so I will, I've been doing that every morning, bit by bit by bit, just taking my time very slowly because in, in previous passes you know we've just gone in and quickly edited each other's stuff and made comments but now i'm going back and looking for continuity issues etc and even finding you know, other little things that just need to be tweaked here and there tightening the language etc and and then by the end of the weekend i will have my next uh, ch- chat my chapter rewritten the last chapter and and a couple other chapters ready to go and then we're, we're pretty close we're only a few chapters away from finishing that first draft, in which case we will be able to spend the beginning of January working on the, you know, finishing the first draft, then getting it to our editor, and then a bit of a back and forth, and hopefully we'll be able to get the um, the book to our narrators, uh, to Sarah and Scott, uh, for narration, which is most likely not going to come out just in time with the release of the book, but that's okay. We'll we'll have it uh, available as soon as we can, and the book launches in March, um, the Ides of March, <laughs> 2023, and I've already started to work on, or plan out the next book, Only Monsters in the Building is the title, I have not yet sent uh, Juan Pedron, my designer, I have not yet sent him the specs for uh, that one, but I will in the next several weeks most likely uh, get that cover, from one, I get a description written, which I'll explain a little bit more in my reflection at the end of this episode, and uh, and get that pre-order up. Um, and who knows, maybe this is something I can try and get out before the end of 2023. But I have already started working on my next nonfiction book. So with, with the success of The Canadian Mounted and how well that book has been doing and my passion for the movie, etc., over the Christmas holidays, as Liz and I were watching Die Hard, and I was reminded of how many times I've watched the movie and that 2023 is going to be the 35th anniversary of the movie, I've put up a uh, pre-order for um, a trivia book about Die Hard, and it's coming out on the 35th anniversary of the film's release, which will be in July of 2023. The pre-order is already up on a whole bunch of sites in ebook format. I need to sort of figure out the the, the pre-order for the print book isn't going to go up until maybe just a couple months before the release because I want to get the actual um, file uh, up there. So the book's going to be called Yippee Kaye Mother Bleep Bleep. And obviously the catchphrase that John McClane uses in, uh, I think, in each of the movies. I mean, he uses it in the first movie and then it, it comes back a number of times. Um, again, it's going to be a, a fun trivia book. I'm looking forward to writing it. I've already put together a bit of an outline and started to dig into some research, including getting a hold of um, a graphic novel. There's two different graphic novels uh, from the franchise. I'm re-watching all of the movies, even though it'll mostly focus on Die Hard 
it is going to talk about the whole franchise in general, some of the trivia related to the books they're based on, etc., etc. Again, a Die Hard fan's guide to the movie Die Hard. And um, working with an artist, um, an awesome artist friend, uh, Nicolette Jones, who's working on some art for me. And then, of course, once I get that art from her, I will be able to send um, send that over to Juan Pedron to get the um, you know the finalization of the cover design done. And so that's uh, that's that process. So I've got uh, that. I'm also uh, I need to I owe uh, Alyssa Kuron, um, my co-author for Weird Waterloo. I owe her a bit of an update. We got to get together so I can get my pull up my socks and get some work done and figure this one out. This is one uh, we plan on pitching to Dundurn. Uh, publisher I've done uh, six uh, I've, I've written and co-authored uh, six different books about true ghost stories so I'd like to see if Dundurn is interested before I take on uh, self-publishing because if they are interested in it um, you know I'm sure the terms will be fine for us to pitch it to them uh, again um, it's our IP we get to choose what we want to do with it sometimes we partner with the publisher sometimes we self-publish it or sometimes as you're going to learn in this chat with Elizabeth, sometimes we partner with AI. Now, at Novelist Inc. in September of 2022 was the first time um, Elizabeth uh, cracked open her laptop at one of the stand-up tables in the main lobby at Novelist Inc. Uh, in St. Pete, Florida, and showed me a little bit of what could be done with PseudoWrite. But of course, as these technologies continue to improve and the developers continue to expand and add things, it's even cooler than when she showed it to me a few months ago. So we talk through that, and I do not want you to be frightened. I do not want you to be scared. I want you to listen to how Elizabeth has experimented with and adapted using an AI tool as a writer into her creative process. And I want you to be open to the possibilities of the ways that you can do the same thing. So that is... Coming up right after this bumper. Elizabeth, welcome to the Stark Reflections podcast. Again, it's so much fun to be here. <laughs> it is. It seems like not that long ago that uh, that we chatted. But, yep, um, and then we also uh, had some fun in Vegas last month. So I think we just keep this a monthly thing, Mark. Like we, we do apparently. something fun each month. Yeah. Every once in a while, we just get caught up on something new. Before we get into the something new... Let's uh, let's get into something borrowed, something blue, because you are a writer of historical romance. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Um, I'm what the kids call an OG. Uh, I've been publishing since 2011. Uh, so I've been there since before Kindle Unlimited ever even existed, back when it was yep. just the KDE Plus program. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, back when borrows were, oh, my gosh, wasn't it like $2.10, I think, that first month? It was something outrageous. Right, uh, right, yeah, yeah. So well, hey, I, uh, I mean, in in the early days, yeah, I guess, did they even have an exclusivity program? They did. Oh, so yeah. I actually wrote it on my way old blog, eawestwriting.blogspot.com, which still is yeah. out there. I'm like leaving it out there just so that like, I have a <laughs> record of where I first started. So every time mm -hmm. I get too big for my britches, I just go back and read that. And I'm like, oh, it was so silly and dumb back then. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, I wrote a whole blog post railing against Amazon requiring exclusivity at the very beginning. Um, yeah. That was back when Mark Coker was railing against it, you know, and um, we still have exclusivity, unfortunately. <laughs> we still do. We still do. But but you've been writing in a very in a very specific genre that you've been obviously very passionate about. Has that yeah. changed much for you? I'm, and let, let's talk, talk about that for any listeners who aren't familiar with what you're uh, what you write. Um. So I write Jane Austen fan fiction for a living. And when I tell people that, I mean, I can be at Lowe's, like the home department store, and I tell somebody and their face lights up because <laughs> usually somebody has some kind of connection to Jane Austen, Mr. Darcy, even if it's not that person in particular, they'll be like, oh, my sister loves that. Or my mother loves that. It's, right. it's um, I don't know, like evergreen content. And at um, 20 books to 50K, I taught about public domain content and how authors can leverage that to connect with their catalog with existing fan bases. So you just, just to clarify, you're not uh, just lifting public domain works off Project Gutenberg and republishing them. You are reimagining the characters and the situations from the Jane Austen universes, right? And, and, and writing in those worlds. 
Right. So for example, this time last year, um, I want, I, I had a dream of Mr. Darcy carrying Elizabeth out of a ball, like a fireman. Okay. Now, obviously okay. there's no firemen in 1812. So now all of a sudden <laughs> there's a fire at the Meriton assembly and Elizabeth goes rushing in to find Jane and she's going to die. And then here comes Darcy who she thinks is an angel and he's lifting her and he's carrying her out. Her, her legs are burned a little bit. I mean, it was a lot of fun. I had to research like burn therapies from 1812, but oh it's a goodness, whole different yeah. story. Yeah. I bet you, I bet you they're a little bit different than they are today. Yeah, just a little. <laughs> Actually, surprisingly, there was a lot of similar stuff that they were doing for Burns back then that we're still doing 200 years later. Really? Oh, wow. That's yes. fascinating. Wow. So so again, it's not just going and grabbing some stuff. It's actually reimagining and putting the characters in different situations. And because it's public domain, you don't have to you know, get permission from 20th Century Fox Studios or yeah. <laughs> Harper Collins or Penguin Random House or any of those things, right? But those people are doing this too. How many different versions of Sherlock do we see out there right now? That's so, true. Yeah. I mean, once you see derivative products or derivative stories, you can't unsee them. Next yeah. thing you realize, oh, we've had garden gnomes, Romeo and Juliet with Nomeo and Juliet, the movie. And, yeah, and yeah, big, yeah. big studios do this all the time because they don't want to play licensing fees either. Right, right. So, um, and that also kind of segues into what I'm here to talk about today a little bit, because yeah. um, so the last couple of weeks have been a little bit scary in the author world because chat GPT dropped and everybody has been panicking. And one of the big <laughs> things that people have been saying is all AI generated content is public domain. Well, somebody has a little bit of experience working public domain works. <laughs> work <laughs> Who might public- that be? <laughs> I don't know. All right, so let's let's break it down for listeners who aren't familiar. Could you maybe give some definitions of like public domain, and and, and then we'll get into Chat uh, GPT and stuff like that. Yeah. So, well, the public domain with the AI is a little bit of a different legal situation, and and I'm not a lawyer, and this is this is actually still very gray, unsettled territory as far right. as what we can do. Um, it's it's a case where, like normal law, hasn't caught up yet with what technology can do. And I think a lot of authors are also kind of misunderstanding, too, that this is an international law um, situation that hasn't been settled yet. And different countries are actually ruling different things where it comes to AI, whether it can be copyrighted, whether it can be trademarked, whether it can't. And so this is going to be something that's going to have to be figured out, I think, over the next five to 10 years um, with different precedents happening and, and things like that. Okay. so Um, right now, just for for clarifications of what when in traditionally public domain. Jane Austen uh, works would be public domain. So 75 years after the author, after the work was produced or whatever yeah, in, in America, because it's different everywhere in the world. But the United the, States actually yeah. has the strict, has the most strict one. Thank you, Mickey Mouse and Sonny Bono. Yeah, no um, kidding, so, <laughs> so basically 75 years after I die or 70 years after I die, my books would be public domain content. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and obviously, and it used to be, I mean, initially when it was first launched in the 1500s, it was two years after the, after a work was published, it, it was in the public domain and could be used anyway. Mm-hmm. And interestingly, because prior to that, when Dickens was writing, the reason publishers are in New York is they were all in New York so they could steal the work and publish it themselves because there yes. were no rights. <laughs> once it got, once the manuscript got off the boat, any publisher the first ones to get it and new york was the first port uh Mm -hmm. again why big publishers were in new york so they could just steal uh works from (laughs) from from writers i actually just read an article about that about like that's also where agents kind of came from they would literally go out into the united states and just try to get a hold of manuscripts that they could then be first publisher on they didn't know what was going to hit and what wasn't kind of like today too But it, but it expanded. It was kind of like, and it was five years after the work and then whatever. And then obviously the advent of Mickey Mouse was one of the big ones where, oh, Mickey Mouse is going to be in the public domain. Let's push it back again. Let's yeah. push it back. Mm-hmm. Now, Steamboat Willie comes into the public domain in 2023, the first appearance where he's not even called Mickey Mouse. Nope. But all that means is the film can, because there, there's additional, and we're not lawyers, neither one of us, but there's additional trademarking, et cetera. So even though... Steamboat Willie will be in the public domain. It doesn't mean anyone can just take and use Mickey Mouse. Like Winnie the Pooh is an example. There was that horror movie that was published this year, Winnie the Pooh, uh, Blood and Honey, because Mm -hmm. Winnie the Pooh went in the public domain, but that's the A.A. Milne uh, story, not the Disney version. So you can't have Winnie with red pants or or whatever. No red shirt. Red shirt. Sorry, red. He's the one who has. Yeah. uh, Yeah. Him and Donald Duck. There's just no pants. Disney had a thing against pants, apparently. 
Yeah, and then like Mickey Mouse doesn't really have a shirt. It's weird. I know. He's the only pants wearer in in the entire di- no, <laughs> but that just means uh, yeah. So that's that's an interesting thing. So that's public domain. That's sort of like books that you know you, you got to go back at least seventy five years mm-hmm. um, to to get that. But when you're talking about pub- like so public, the idea of public domain is that anyone in the public can consume and remodify it and and adjust it. It's almost like a Creative Commons uh, with no attribution <laughs> license, right, or something like that. Yes, and public domain is really important for um, culture, believe it or not. We, we have, you know, academic studies and stuff like that where if a culture doesn't have access to public domain content, public domain content dies. We would yeah. not have Shakespeare today still in the, you know, common intellect and everything like that if we weren't able to build off of what Shakespeare did 400 years ago. Right, and there's even yeah. some arguments if Shakespeare was one person. <laughs> right, right, and that'd be like West Side Story, for example, which obviously was one of the one of the more popular, you know, nineteen fifties retelling of or whatever, whenever that first came out. Mm-hmm. And then there's time travel. We wouldn't really have time travel books without public domain because a Connecticut court, a, a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's court, was actually fan fiction of La Mort de Arthur. So Mark okay. Twain lifted whole passages of this fifteen hundreds manuscript into his book <laughs> and wrote about somebody time traveling to it. And now we have the whole genre of time travel. Wow. Amazing stuff. So, so public domain is, 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 is for the good it really of, is. of, of the, of culture, of literary community, of being able to take it to the next level. Right. And I think that AI there's, there's some middle ground there because the truth is the artificial intelligence was trained by all of us. And I have had to explain to people that, you know, a lot of people are saying like, why wasn't anyone paid for the books and things that it scraped? Okay. And, and yeah. that's a fair argument. Right. And, and I have two points to that. The first one is most of us consented without realizing it. Okay. We didn't really understand our terms and conditions. We just said, yeah, 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 yeah. We use the free document, you know, creators, we use the free social media, we posted our chapters on newsletters and had that available. We tweeted our chapters out. In my case, yeah. it has a lot of my writing because all of my chapters have been free on my website. Right. So unfortunately, we kind of live in this world where, at least electronically, use has turned into consent if there is access to your writing. Right. So I'm not talking about stuff that is behind a paywall. That That is still not okay for them to grab. But if something is freely available on the internet... Unfortunately, the, the machines can learn it. The robots right. have been crawling this since the internet started. Right. And 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 let's let's go back to what, what writers have been doing forever since the beginning <laughs> of writing is we've been able to read any book we want, you know, any any access, have access to watch movies, listen to listen to music, uh, do do experience things, and then we just reinterpret and readapt things. A lot of the stories we tell may have been influenced by the 150 books we last read uh, because they're still gestating in the back of our heads that doesn't mean that we owe the writer well i owe stephen king some work because when i read it i was inspired <laughs> right <laughs> right that's the it's, it's not all that different right Past, pastiche works like works that are literally like i'm going to rewrite this chapter in the style of this author or something like that is is a cornerstone of the early creative writing exercises that every student does whether yeah. you're middle school, high school, or in college, you're going to be forced to work in writing different voices and things like that so that you you learn how to have your own voice. Yeah. So that's also, I think, a cornerstone in our industry that people are overlooking or just forgetting that that's there. The other point that I would make is we did get paid and we did benefit from it. We just didn't realize. So <laughs> because the machines have learned from this whole human existence that's on the interweb or, or on the internet, we now have medical applications where AI can read x-rays and find things that human doctor eyes can't find catching, right. catching cancer and stuff earlier. Um, all of us have phones that have autocomplete and that is the same algorithm. I didn't pay anything for autocomplete. It just showed up one day on my phone. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, duck it all too, right? I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> duck it all autocomplete. <laughs> uh, well, no, that's, uh, that's the, uh, what is it? The, correct the auto corrector uh, yeah. auto correct oh auto complete yeah. i was thinking about auto correct yeah. <laughs> but no auto correct came from that same that same tree right yeah 
Um, Grammarly, for example, a lot of authors have been putting a line in the sand of like, I will never publish a manuscript that has touched AI. You probably already have. Uh <laughs> betcha, betcha, betcha you have. Yes. Oh, oh, come on. Even Word has built in stuff <laughs> to help you find grammar Dictation, problems. If you are a dictator, which I am. Um, not not like a you're not a dictator person. like a like a horrible person who does yeah not a horrible and, person okay. all right okay <laughs> but I use dictation and I have since 2014. Uh, Nuance is actually one of the earliest NPLs or N, I'm sorry NLPs natural language processors. Okay. And what that meant was when it transcribed what it heard from the MP3 uh, recording, it wasn't just transcribing on what it heard; it was also using context to predict what I was saying. So sometimes okay. the transcript wasn't 100% what I said. Right. Okay. Sometimes it was better. <laughs> sometimes it was better. <laughs> so so we've been living with AI for, for, for quite a while, but we haven't really, it hasn't been a thing that we've kind of taken and said, over there, that's the AI thing we can point at, right? Well, yeah, the, the, chat, the chat bots have been around for a couple of years. I've been in the open source community since the early 2000s. So um, they've always been there. A lot of our customer service, believe it or not, if you're chatting with something, it may not actually be a person. It's probably an AI that's that's answering you back and has like hand responses based on keywords and what you're asking for. Right. Oh um, my God. It's one of the, one of the first computer programs I remember writing in basic was, was a fake um, um, psychiatrist. Oh, wow. Who, a therapist who would repeat stuff back to you from what you typed in. <laughs> How are you All feeling, Mark? Basic was pick a blue. Why are you feeling blue, check. Mark? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was a number number generator, like trying to guess the number in like five guesses. Yeah, that kind of thing. But but again, it, I mean, it, I mean, and that goes back to the eighties for me. Yeah, it was the eighties for me too. When I was, I had a little VTech computer that um, you had one line, and it, yep. it it was basic, and it came with like a little notepad, and I was typing the lines of code into it to do like little simple games. Yeah, there you go. There you go. So so we have had this uh, for a while. But but I mean, you've been involved. I remember at Novelist Inc. earlier this year, you, you know, you, you um, doing this for so many different writers saying, here, let me show you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> let me show you this cool thing I've been playing. I was with. a little bit of an evangelist on pseudo right. But that's because these tools are there. And I all of like, the other community are my friends. They've been my friends for almost two decades at this point. Yeah, we all suffer from autoimmune issues or life problems, divorces, deaths and families, people losing parents, people, you know, and we all have those days of like, I need to do my career. I need to write my books, but my creative well is drier than a bone. And all of a sudden there's this new little robotic co-writer that's always there for you and doesn't get mad if you don't take its idea. <laughs> <laughs> it has no ego. I love that. Um, I love that. So that's why I showed it on uh, like Joe Solari's podcast. Um, I'm real. I, I'm starting to make good friends with um, the founder of PseudoWrite, Amit Gupta. I'm in their Slack, and now I'm doing classes on how to uh, collaborate with AI for whatever the pinch point is in your writing process. So, so what what is PseudoWrite for listeners who say, okay, this sounds interesting. What is it? So first of all, it's S U D O W R I T E. Not pseudo like fake, like fake in Latin, but pseudo, which is a computer command actually in uh, Unix, super do. So you do really? pseudo bash. Yeah, you do <laughs> pseudo bash uh, if you're trying to get in root as like the super user and override different commands um, at the prompt. Uh, and I only know that because of my open source days of, of working with the Fedora project and things. Okay. Uh, so pseudo write is basically like you are the super user. You are the creative director, the conductor. You can put in information. Um, for example, if I put in the line, Mr. Darcy stared out um, his window looking at the snow across the grounds of Pemberley. I could put that in there. I can highlight grounds of Pemberley, say describe, and it'll give me descriptions in all five senses plus two metaphorical. Oh. Uh-huh. If I had that same sentence and I'm like, I don't know what happens next. I'm stuck. Pseudo, right? You're my only hope. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I can highlight that and I can say expand. And the little robot will go like, I don't know what's going on, but I'll give her something. And it'll give me about 150 to 200 words. Now, will those be logical narrative words? Not entirely. About 50 to 100 words will be will make sense. And then sometimes it kind of goes a little... I don't know where it was going, but we're not going there. But what I find 
as I write faster in pseudo write because it's like I'm a trapeze artist and that's the safety net. So if you suffer from blank pageitis, any kind of anxiety whatsoever about your writing session, you get into pseudo write, you start writing. If you get stuck, it's just a click button away to get some input, to get some creative juices, so to speak, on tap that you can go, oh, I don't like that. But you know what? That just gave me two more ideas. Let me go ahead and, and, and put those in. So it's like performance art with a safety net underneath for writing. So I run into this all the time when I'm writing. And, and it's one of the reasons I can't write that fast is I go, oh, I've got to go research this. What does this sound like, look like, taste like? What would this X, X, X? And then I end up going off on the, onto Google and trying to get some details. And in the meantime, I could potentially have someone else going and getting those details and dropping them in. And then I can just select the pieces I think work, re mm -hmm. rescript it and go, oh, good. This is this is the whatever. Like, you know, it could be a simple thing like, do, do you know, for a peanut allergy in one of the characters, do, 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 is this, what's a dish that contains peanuts that would be served at a whatever restaurant, right? That kind oh, of yeah. thing. Yeah, you can actually ask the AI, give me a list of 10 dishes commonly served at restaurants that have peanuts that people wouldn't think have it. Yeah, exactly. And so that um, that saves a bunch of that sort of waste of time, right? also ask you to describe right? anaphylactic shock. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Instead of like <laughs> for real for realism, right? Because it's it's crawling the medical journals. <laughs> well, yes, it does have the ability to lie to you, but for the most part, it won't if it's if it's something that, like like that, like something that's right. that's tangible and everything like that. Right. Um. But again, that goes back to you are the creative director. You are the human. You are responsible for all of those words. So even if I if I didn't know anything about anaphylactic shock, which obviously I do know some things, but if I didn't know anything about what would happen to somebody with a peanut allergy, I would use the AI to help me, but I would still go check it myself just to make sure that it's correct. And that could be something done in the rewrite, or if it's a critical yes. plot point, you may need to stop right there and go, well, is it actually going to be a thing? Or is this just a minor, because sometimes it's a minor filler detail that yes. isn't pertinent to the hinging of the, <laughs> of the resolution. Right. Um, of the or you could do what I do, which is, I have beta readers because they get my chapters for free and they will tell me mistakes that I make. Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 <laughs> like, this, this gun doesn't fire that way. Yeah, yeah I, exactly. <laughs> that town does those two streets in that town. Don't, don't ever cross. Well, they do in my world. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So pseudo writes kind of feels like it's a collaborator or it's like a combination of a, of, of a co-author and a muse. Yes. Is that, is that right? Yeah. And it, it only works on what you feed it. So this is one of the things that um, the big contention about where it comes to this public domain content. If I'm doing the feeding, and when I say a feed, we also, we call them prompts. Okay. So a prompt is custom to what I give it. Now, obviously somebody can do a generic prompt, describe a rose bed. That's yeah. a very generic prompt. But if I say, describe a rose bed that has been neglected for six months at Pemberley, now that's a very specific, that's a much more specific prompt. Right, or, right. Um, so the way for authors to really kind of make sure that the little robot is giving them unique creative things is you need to be unique and creative at the start. Right. So that way you're getting something that is unique to what your ideas were. Um, okay. Go ahead, question. Well, no, no, I was just gonna ask, so does that mean that if you're using pseudo write? Is there context of your previous book so that it understands the kinds of descriptions you've used in this? Because you're writing historical romance, and I'm writing modern urban fantasy. Um, potentially, if you, if I ask for a rose garden that's been neglected for six months, and you mention a rose garden that's been neglected, let's pretend we don't mention Pemberley. Does it understand within the context of, oh, over here, it's going to be a Pemberley kind of thing. And over there, it's going to be some spot in New York <laughs> or whatever. I don't know. Is it, does it, do you feed With it that much? It it... Can. So okay. if you are in a document and um, you're in a document and you have so far this whole science fiction pro prompt or whatever, and then you say, describe a rose bed, it's going to go based off of the stuff that's above it and understand the context that we're, we're in like a post-apocalyptic okay. world or something like that. I know okay. it's crazy, but it's limited. It can only go back about 500 to a thousand words. It can't, oh, okay. it can't yet do a whole manuscript. Now we're working with the developers to say, hey, because there is a capability for AI for you to create what's called a fine tune. And this is a better, better conversation for somebody who's a developer, which I'm not, I don't code. Like we talked about base. I stopped at basic. I tapped out at HTML. I'm like, no, nope, don't code. 
Yeah. Um, but there is, I understand that there's the capability of doing a fine tune, the cost involved right now to do a fine tune. I'm not 100% sure on because I think it's 20 cents per 1000 tokens, whereas okay. per generation it's about two cents per thousand tokens. And to explain what a token is, AI thinks of words in pieces that you and I would call a phonic. So TH, for example, we know that TH together, there's a whole bunch of different letters that could come next. And so yes. it's predicting based on those components of words. So a token is roughly four characters. Okay. Um, and, and I know this is very confusing and, and authors are like, wait, what? Because we think in <laughs> words, but the AI doesn't. So the best way to right. describe it is a thousand tokens is about 700 to 750 words. Okay. All right. Um, so it costs more to teach it. It does not cost as much to use it. So, okay. I gotcha. And we're, we're working on, so the people who have created these marvelous tools, love them to pieces. They're not authors themselves. <laughs> so okay. they don't know how, like, it's so fun because we talk with them and we're like, Hey, we're doing X, Y, Z. And they're like, we had no idea that you would do X, Y, Z with this. And then mm -hmm. they build uh, buttons and things that work for it. So I was using um, OpenAI Playground, which is that is a um, an environment for developers to test out different prompts for like the programs that they're making. It's not designed for a writer to go in there and write books. I just hacked it and make it do it. Right, right. Um, and I I told Pseudo Red, I was like, hey, I'm getting these outlines by saying create for me a 15 part outline uh in the structure of save the cat for the following premise and then giving it a premise and i'm getting an outline and they're like can you do that in pseudo right and i was like i tried but i i keep getting stuck and it's only giving me pieces so like the next week they were like here's first draft and now i can put that prompt into pseudo right and pseudo right gives me the whole the whole outline and pseudo right really? is actually better than playground because pseudo right has been fine-tuned and tweaked and has learned how to do fiction writing Whereas playground is just like wide open AI. It's everything. Sometimes yeah, it's it, everything. It doesn't yeah. know that I want fiction. Right. Okay. Wow. So wait, that that exists in pseudo right now. So if I'm yeah. so if I'm having an issue trying to outline a book because <clears throat> um Panzer. So uh, if I have I have issues outlining. <laughs> and that could be a thing where it's like, well, this could help me to learn how to outline properly. It could potentially help me fill in those gaps because all I know is when I'm writing the story, it all just comes together. And that may require going back and tweaking things later on. But it potentially that outline could save writer's time. So much more. Not just outlining, but if you are a pantser, you can you can use it to summarize what you've already written. So it'll <laughs> it'll it'll create for you that outline. So let's say you're 30,000 words in and you're like, oh man, I should have kept better notes. <laughs> I have felt right. that way, have you? All the time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now you can have those 30,000 words in there and you can go chapter by chapter and tell pseudo write, summarize this, summarize this, summarize this. And it'll oh, do a log okay. line and a summary of what happened in that chapter. Oh, I love that. Oh my God. That could save so much time. They also <laughs> simulate readers reading your writing. Say so what? What do you mean? Yeah. They simulate? So, so what people like go, oh my God, you suck. Or this is awesome. <laughs> no, I'm, this is and they so give meta. you reviews. This no. The, the AI judging the AI. Uh, mm -hmm. So it has a feedback option, and I, I'd be happy to share my screen um, yeah. whenever we're ready for that to talk about uh, some of these features and show them. Um, but the feedback option, you, you do have to turn on your labs in PseudoWrite if you're going to use these these tools. But or Turn on your labs? What does that yeah, mean? Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a function that's in beta, because basically they made it do it, but they weren't sure what we would do with it. So we haven't oh, okay. explained to them what it'll do. It'll simulate three readers reading it, and it'll say, I thought the theme of this section was blah, 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 blah. I really liked blah, 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 blah. Here are three areas that you could help improve the writing of this section. And it actually touches on things that a developmental editor would say to you. Like, there's not a lot of details about the setting. Or I, I didn't get an emotional uh, understanding of why such and such character's motivation was this. And every uh -huh. once in a while when I read that, I'm like, wait, I meant to put that in there. And I go back and read I'm like, Tag Nabbit. Sure enough, I did not put some, I was writing so right. fast that I didn't put something there. And the little robot reader said, hey, this is kind of choppy and I don't know why this character is doing this. So in the same way that uh, Pro Writing Aid uh, mm -hmm. helps me before I send a manuscript to the editor, I want to clean up some of the stuff that's going to take a human 
waste it's going to waste their time because there's like i've told you mark you always do this mm -hmm. so so you know uh, pro writing aid helps me get rid of maybe 60 percent of those things yes so that saves me money and time it saves my editor time too because they can get it done faster because they're not hung up on the stupid things i always do smart <laughs> so it's almost like pseudo -write. write could could also give me some of that feedback to also help me before i send it to an editor to go Oh yeah, that emotional resonance in the scene isn't strong enough. I need to go back and fix that. Mm -hmm. So again, these are tools that could potentially ultimately help writers and save uh, aggravation from their editors <laughs> or their <laughs> whatever beta readers. Okay, so it, it's almost like one of those things that polishes and smooth helps you smooth things down a little bit too, right? As you learn how to use it, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I keep trying to tell authors that I think that the AI revolution is going to help us get back to basics. Because what does the robot understand? It understands the like literary terms that we had to learn for all of us who took yeah. grad level classes or, or anything like that. And I put it through its paces. I made it do, oh gosh, I'm going to butcher this, a Petruchian sonnet. You got me. What, what's... <laughs> so there's a sonnet by uh, Shakespeare that like he talks about how ugly his lover is, but he loves her in, just in spite of herself. Her hair's like wires, her skin's like done. That kind of thing. So it's a mm -hmm. sonnet that you make fun of something in order to make it uh, to 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 ultimately glorify it. It's basically like I try explaining that one to your partner. No, no, no. It's a Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> it's the it's the early origins of sarcasm, <laughs> and uh, so it was able to do it. It was able to write me a country western lyrics to a country western song. It was uh, one night in one of my classes. We interviewed the candle that sat on Edgar Allan Poe's desk. Let me tell you something. That candle was very loyal. I said, well, you know, Edgar Allan Poe drank a lot. Did he ever knock you off the desk? And the candle said, no, he never knocked me off the desk. And even when Edgar Allan Poe was drunk, he still was dedicated to his writing, writing at the desk with me by candlelight. I'm like, <laughs> may there be a candle on my desk that talks so highly of me when I'm gone. <laughs> In some ways, we all felt like we went to Hogwarts and there's this magical spell that you can interact with it. Uh, let's see, what were we doing last night? Last night we came up with, um, we were simulating a science fiction romance. So I wrote a premise of answer me like a woman, a middle-aged woman from Milwaukee who has just been abducted by a spaceship uh, out of your backyard in the middle of barbecue with the beer still in your hand. And so I'm asking her like, how did it feel to be abducted? And she's, she's talking to me about like, my stomach was nauseated. Um, I, I felt very dis I, like disoriented. I didn't know where I was. And we're talking to this character. And then I was like, hold on, guys. Did you spill your beer? And it wrote back, absolutely not. I managed to hold my beer intact while I was being <laughs> by aliens. <laughs> Come on, priorities. <laughs> yeah, priorities. Priorities, people. <laughs> so I think it's hilarious. One night it had me crying because we were interviewing an alien who had lost its own planet. Um, I was working with another author and we were doing that interview. So it's it's just, it's an amazing piece of software. I wish more authors were playing with it. Oh, wow. So, so how, how does that work exactly? So you said you, you write in pseudo, right? Is it uh, online? Yeah. Um, did you want me to share my screen and I can show you a little bit about it? Well, maybe we'll do that afterwards. Uh, okay, I'll sure. save that video as a se separate section, uh, yeah. but, um, but just sort of explain. So how that works and, and so pseudo, right is, um, uh, can anyone just go and use it? Uh, what's the cost? What's the structure? How does that all? Work? Yeah, so it's um, a cloud. It's a cloud system. They do have. They are working on a brand new extension for Google Docs so that you'd be able to use Google Doc, uh, pseudo write inside of Google Docs. Okay. But it is cloud based. Uh, you do get a certain amount of words free now, but they have a Slack that you can join. So it's about tw if you go monthly, it's twenty nine dollars for ninety thousand words right now. Ninety thousand words, twenty nine dollars per ninety thousand words. Yep. And that's all the words generated, not words you copy and paste or type into it. So okay, what, it, it's a little hard to explain without seeing it. But when you put in a prompt, it'll generate these like note cards. It, it looks a lot like Scrivener, believe it or not. Okay. Um, it's very pleasing on the eye. It's got different right. themes that you can choose. And so $29 for 90,000 words. And then if you want to go to like 350,000 words, I think it is right now. Hold on, okay. let me go to the pricing page. It is, I think, 129, and it's cheaper if you if you pay for the whole year. That's the that's the short version of this. But when we were calculating this out, okay, so there is actually a hobby student method at ten dollars a month. 
oh, hold on, let me go monthly. $19 a month gets you 30,000 words. Okay. And then $29 a month monthly gets you 90,000 words and $129 gets you 300,000 words. If okay. you go yearly, you can save a lot more. You can you can you can save and just be basically ten dollars, twenty dollars, or a hundred dollars a month. Okay. So All you right. save more money if you go yearly. And so I guess if I if I were to pick maybe the, like the student one, but then I end up going over how do how do they get us to the next level? Like what do I have to do to whoops? It just she cuts just, like, off in the middle or to the next one. Okay. And if you're going monthly, you could change your plan each month. So let's say you have months that you don't write. You may just go down to the student at ten dollars to hold your hold your seat, basically. Right. Um, okay. And then, okay. Uh, and and that way you're you're not writing that that month, or maybe you're on big deadline, and so you have to go up. Okay. Um, so that's your your option, and it has a brand new feature too. That's like a canvas. It's it's experimental. It's in beta. Right. But it's working with Dolly, where you go in and you make a card, and we're all familiar with that with Scrivener. Like you make a card. Well, now you can click visualize and it'll automatically create you AI art that goes with your note card. Oh, neat. Okay. That's kind of cool. Of what your plot. So you can make a whole storyboard without having to hire any, any yeah. illustrators or anything like that. You would be able to wow. make like a rough storyboard for, for what your story is. So you, how long have you been, I, I know you've been dabbling in this technology for quite a while. How long have you been using PseudoWrite, for example, to, to help with your, your own writing? Since November of 2021. I have written okay. and released three books with the aid of AI. Wow. So what? let's let's break that down in terms of did that save is it had to have saved time and money in terms of how much your editor has to work on it. Maybe even your beta readers, you're, you're kind of getting early feedback so that you can please them better or potentially. Yes. Uh, so last last summer, I kind of did an experiment uh, with myself and I released two books back to back using okay. like they, they I had partially completed manuscripts and I used AI to help me formulate and finish them off so I published a book at the end of May and a book at the end of June uh last oh. year back and normally back what day. would your process have been like what was uh, it normally I go months between releases this was just okay. to see if I could do it with novels I'd never done novels back to back like that before um a little bit with dictation way back in the day but not since like I've had pain and things like that so I was able to do it um okay. my process used to be I would kind of outline, slapdash outline, very similar to like a Neil Gaiman method or, or many other authors who just like with a pen and paper, usually it's a composition notebook. Um, I just write down scene beats, anything that's coming to my mind. Yeah. I take those and I would dictate them. So I would have my MP3 recorder. I'd close my eyes. I'd listen to my musical scores and stuff like that. Usually walk, not walking all the time, obviously with my eyes closed, but if I'm not walking, yeah, I have my eyes be closed. Careful. Right? <laughs> I'm walking eyes open and I'll just dictate the scene. It's usually about 12 to 20 minutes for me to get about 700 to a thousand words. Okay. Then I would plug that into the computer and then the computer would transcribe that. And then I would have this rough, you know, in about 45 minutes of walking, all of a sudden I would have like 2000 to 3000, just like, I don't want to call them garbage words. They're not garbage, but it's like vomit words. I mean, right. yeah. it's, it has a logical flow, but there's no, it, it would be too rough for anyone to read. And so then I'm going in and spending about twice the amount of time it took to record it to type into it, clean this up, move this over here, expand that. Um, and that was a step, the first step, first time I started using PseudoWrite, that was the step where PseudoWrite came in for me. I would use PseudoWrite to help me edit those transcribed words. Oh, okay. Wait, it used it to help edit the same way we use Grammarly or Pro Writing Aid? No, it's even more advanced than that because I was able to go, okay, this sentence I just said, like when I'm dictating, I'm like, Mr. Bennett was mad. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not going to okay. publish that. But I can say pseudo Because that's, that's telling, not showing. Exactly. <laughs> so there's a rewrite function that says show, not tell. No, wait, 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 wait. wait. Show, but, not tell. You'd highlight a sentence and say show, don't tell. Yes, and it'll do it. It'll give you two two cards or as up to six. I know it's really fun <laughs> to play with. Now, um, even what it created though, not necessarily would I always be able to just go, okay, I'm going to use all 300 of those words. Cause sometimes it's like, here's 200 words. I only need like 50 to 60 to expand this sentence. Out. Right. Yeah. So, so it's, it is like a co-author where you're like, yeah, yeah, that's good. But let's cut this and this and this and this uh -huh. and let's change this. And okay. So it's, and it's, it's not, not a, <laughs> It's not that somebody who doesn't know how to write can suddenly push a button and have a, a great novel. It's a, a writer uses this as a tool. It sounds yes. like, okay. 
we've been talking in our groups that this is like an upgrade to superpowers. It feels like we, <laughs> like if we're in a science fiction movie or whatever, all of a sudden we have superpowers. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I can lift that heavy object now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It doesn't okay. matter if it's with the aid of a forklift. <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. And so um, as, as we get close to wrapping up the, mm -hmm. uh, the audio portion of this interview, the uh, where can people find out more uh, first about you? Uh, and then secondly, where can they find out more about Pseudorite and check it out? Sure. So I'm author Elizabeth Ann West. Um, so I'm on all the bookstores and everything as that. Um, and that's also my legal name. But what authors need to know is my website and it's my Facebook group. And the website has the links to the, the class. So it's the intro to collaborate with AI tools for outlining prose and editing. So people and, can still check that out. They can still oh, yes. check out the introductory so class. Okay. The way I teach my classes is very different than other people. Um, I don't do like a module thing because number one, I never finish those things. Number two, right. this stuff is so cutting edge that I'd have to constantly redo the curriculum. So right. the way it works is if you purchase the class tuition, you get all of the recordings of the classes I've run. You also get to come to all the live sessions I have scheduled that month. And you also get to come to any future live sessions that I, that I create. So oh, each wow. month I'm doing like six to 10 live sessions. And how much does that cost an author? It's $99. So $99 gets me access to your previous classes. It gets me access to your live stuff you're doing now. And then if you do another one in January or February, mm -hmm. or whatever, it's also. You can come to that one as well. Wow. So and okay. it's, it's just the intro to AI collaboration. And I've taught like this since 2018. I used to have a whole school on business topics and things like that. So um, I am somebody in, in the industry who, who like I'm vetted, I've, I've been teaching at conferences and things like that. So it's, it's right. good information and it's, it's going to teach you like you, you have to use the tool ethically, but it's going to power, empower you with the knowledge of how to do that and to decide where it fits in your writing process. Awesome. Awesome. Well, there will, of course, be links to all of that in the show notes. Elizabeth, before we we close off, mm -hmm. a word of advice from you to authors who are listening to this are are scared as hell that this is Terminator days and and suddenly <laughs> Skynet's going to decide humans shouldn't exist because they're dangerous to the planet. Yep. Um, <laughs> but, you know, writers who have those sort of dystopian thoughts What's something uh, that you might want or a few things you may want to say to them to help them understand that potentially the future is so bright we got to wear shades? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I would say if you're an experienced writer. You're going to understand this. What's the first thing a reader says to you after they get your recent release? They say, where's the next one? When's the next one? Okay. So until AI is able to spit out a book, a well-written book, and the speed at which an, a reader can read it, we're never going to be fast enough for our readers to be satisfied. Okay. Um, and so in that way, I would say, and I actually had AI write a little allegory about this and it came up with this, that, you know, this wise author was mad that the AI was stealing and learning how to write and it went to a wise man on a mountain. And he said, you know, the AI has not excluded you, use its tools to work with it. And so then the author learned that basically use the AI to help with it, what it does best, which was speed. And I think our culture has moved to such a con quick consumption of content even things like on netflix and stuff like that stuff's here top one blip gone three weeks later there's something new that has replaced it if you if you watch kind of like what people talk about right ai is going to arm indie authors to stay relevant and how fast things are moving in the next five to ten years that you can keep producing more books more content every idea that you get in the shower you can now turn into a book rather than having to go I only have time to write two this year. Right. Right. Because my my issue isn't uh, the ideas. My issue is the time to implement them all. It's and this may be a tool that can help me implement more, not all of them, but potentially mm -hmm. more of those ideas if I if I learn how to embrace and leverage those tools. Yeah. it's it, We've been riding horses and now the cars have arrived. You can choose to get in a car or you can keep riding a horse for another 20 or 30 years. But eventually you're, you're going to have to give up the horse. Eventually. Oh, Elizabeth, thanks so much for hanging out with me today and, and sharing some uh, some cool new technological things. Yeah. So there's the interview with Elizabeth. I hope you found that insightful and exciting. I I guess I, I just want to reflect on, and, 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 and I'm going to probably repeat myself as I already have numerous times, 
that this new technology can be disruptive, it can be scary, but it's a tool, just like a computer is a tool, just like a typewriter is a tool, just like dictation, the audio recorders, etc. Just like our cell phones are tools that we can leverage as creative people. I love the fact that Elizabeth used the term creative director. I'm the creative director. And and she gets to decide. And you, your name is on this, so you get to decide how you leverage these tools. I already use Pro Writing Aid to you know clean up a manuscript before I send it to an editor. So that's a tool I use to save myself time and money. I have an AI voice. I've been using that. I have done AI versions of my audiobooks. And I even used Midjourney, uh, the AI uh, art tool, to create some concepts to send to Nicolette, um, who's going to be the, uh, who is the artist who's doing that uh, book I talked about, the Die Hard book. And, and, and so we're using this as a tool. And I'm going to go into Suda right myself, and I'm going to check out the um, the platform. I'm going to I'm going to play with it a little bit more because I've only played with it with Elizabeth. Now, we did mention in the interview that she was going to show me some stuff, and so I recorded. I continue to record uh, the video of Elizabeth showing because the video is kind of useful because you can see what's on her screen. And normally, this would be something I would uh, put up on. Uh, I am putting it up on Patreon. Um, um, and normally I would lock it down to patrons only, but I'm, I'm putting it up there and, uh, I'm going to be allowing anyone to view it, um, just so you can kind of benefit from, uh, seeing that. And also there will be, um, links in the show notes at starkreflections.ca for getting, um, access to the courses if you're interested in learning more, uh, about AI. Um, there'll, there'll be links to whatauthorsneedtoknow.com, which is where she's teaching this. But also she shared a coupon code for listeners to the podcast. If you want to purchase uh, the course from Elizabeth, uh, you can get 10% off uh, of her classes. And you can use Stark10, S-T-A-R-K-10, and you can check that out. And there'll be, there'll be a link to that in the show notes at starkreflections.ca. So with that thought about AI, I wanted to share something that I thought was kind of interesting. So I mentioned the book Only Monsters in the Building, and I did this with Chat uh, G- GPT. Uh, and, and Chat uh, GPT, just, just um, uh, to explain, the GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Woohoo, very exciting. Uh, just It's a thing I always forget, which is why I'm sharing it with, with you today. But what, what I did was I was playing with it. I did I did a few different experiments, but I thought, oh, so interestingly, I have this idea for only monsters in the building based on some stuff Julie and I have written in Hex in the City. And so I thought, well, what if I, after playing a little bit with chat GPT, um, what if I put in this prompt? And here's the prompt uh, that I wrote. Um, and and I, I'm going to share what chat GPT came up with. So I wrote this prompt. Write a description for a humorous urban fantasy thriller called Only Monsters in the Building. Michael Andrews, a Canadian writer living in New York City with a werewolf curse, has been trying to live a normal life, but his superhuman strength and heightened senses lead him to helping others in need. When his mentor, a gregarious traveling salesman named Buddy J. Samuels, shares that there's a way for Michael to learn how to better live with his special powers, he sends Michael to a remote location in upstate New York for a retreat with four other supernatural creatures. While there, something terrible happens, and Michael has to figure out who he can trust to save the day. So that's the prompt I gave it. So a very, very detailed prompt, and and I learned a bit of that from Elizabeth. Here's what ChatGPT came up with. Michael Andrews thought he had finally found a way to control his werewolf curse and live a normal life in New York City. But when his mentor, Buddy J. Samuels, introduces him to a group of supernatural creatures at a retreat in upstate New York, Michael realizes that he still has a lot to learn about his powers. As he joins forces with a mischievous fairy, a brooding vampire, a sassy mermaid, and a grumpy ogre, Michael finds himself caught up in a dangerous mystery. Something terrible has happened at the retreat, and it's up to Michael and his new friends to figure out who is responsible. 
But with a host of suspects and a limited time to solve the case, Michael must use all of his wit and strength to uncover the truth. Can he trust his fellow creatures, or is one of them the real monster in the building? Only Monsters in the Building is a humorous urban fantasy thriller that will have you on the edge of your seat as Michael tries to solve the mystery and save the day. Okay, so <laughs> that's the blurb that this AI came up with. And I'll be honest with you, I had the idea he's there. Maybe it's going to be like a closed, mur- closed room mystery kind of deal where he's there with some other monsters. There's going to be some humor as he learns a little bit more about the paranormal world um, because he's still pretty naive about everything going on in it. And I had no idea what the other monsters were going to be. So I'm looking at this and I go, okay, mischievous fairy, cool. A brooding vampire, that could be fun. Sassy mermaid, oh yeah. A grumpy ogre. Uh, So I may change the the monsters, um, but what a cool idea. Like this is just sort of rife for some fun. And, uh, and I even, I, I love the idea that it came up with the uh, suspects and limited. And so, yeah, I, I, I can have some really great interplay, uh, this therapy. Uh, I'm also even thinking, I know it, it's, uh, everything is derivative of, of everything, right? But there's uh, this really great scene in the um, uh, Marvel She-Hulk uh, TV series where where the they're all sitting around uh I, I, wow well i guess it's a retreat is that where i I'm just thinking about that now is that where the idea of sending them to a retreat came from wow interesting well anyways yeah so i mean obviously the idea I, I, that came to me uh the title i saw you know obviously i was thinking about only murders in the building and i love the i love that series and i th- just only monsters in, in the building came to me as a title and I was like oh wouldn't it be neat if Michael had to go somewhere to learn more about uh how to be a how to properly be a werewolf <laughs> because he can't even control the changes etc so I thought it would be a humorous thing and that's where I thought about the retreat well what if there's other monsters there and bam 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 and so of course all these things came together now I'm realizing well maybe the idea of the retreat came from She-Hulk and stuff right so this is the thing about AI is our brains are constantly absorbing little bits of this, little bits of that, and, and, and coming up with stuff. And then the AI does a similar thing. It can just do it in a different way. It can do it faster. So I'm, I'm going to obviously, I'm going to probably take this description. I'm going to play with it a little. I'm going to chew on it. I'm going to come up with something because I'm going to need to have something like that to uh, give to Juan. Uh, you know, so he can do the cover along in the series uh, format and style. And then, of course, start working on potentially outlining um, uh, the novel and how that's going to work. But anyways, I just wanted to give you an example of how I thought, okay, let's play with this. Let's see where it can go. And it's kind of neat. It's almost like bouncing, like Julie and I in, in, in the co-authoring, bouncing ideas off each other. Well, what if, what if this? And then we talk about it, right? So the only thing, the only difference here is the AI comes up with something, and if I don't like it, I don't even have to, you know, be nice or gentle. I can just ignore it, um, which is kind of cool. It's like you know, the co-author um, uh, isn't gonna isn't gonna be insulted if if I don't play with that idea or take it to the next level. So, anyways, I just wanted you to th- enjoy that. I just wanted you to think about the possibilities and where you may be able to leverage this in your creative life. Now. Uh, I do want to say a shout out to the awesome patrons who support this podcast over at patreon.com slash dark reflections. And again, that's where you're going to see the video and courtesy of my awesome patrons. That's where the patrons will get to see the video of, El- of Elizabeth walking me through some of the details of pseudo right. But of course, everyone who is a listener can go there and it will be open for everyone to check out. It is the 29th of December as I'm recording this. We're two days away from 2023. 20, uh, that can be a scary time, especially, you know, lately, the last several years, we've, we've thought, well, how could, how could things get any worse than this? And, and what does Clark Griswold say? Worse? How could things get any worse? We're at the threshold of hell. Anyways, <laughs> that's from Christmas Vacation. But, but again, uh, I want to wish you all the best uh, as, as you round out uh, the year 2022, if you're listening to this still in December, um, but all the best in, in the coming year 2023. And if you're listening to this in the distant, distant future, well, um, wishing you all the best for what lies ahead wherever you happen to be. So until next week, next episode, and 
And next year, for those of you who are listening to this right around the time it comes out, this is Mark Leslie Lefebvre wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com. Where do you think you're going? Nobody's leaving. Nobody's walking out on this fun, old-fashioned family Christmas. No, no, we're all in this together. This is a full-blown, four-alarm holiday emergency here. We're going to press on, and we're going to have the hap, hap, happiest Christmas since Bing Crosby tap danced with Danny f***ing K. And when Santa squeezes his fat white a- down that chimney night, he's going to find the jolliest bunch of assholes this side of the nut house. You're goofy. Don't piss me off, Art. Clark? It's over. Not according to Santa's watch, it isn't. Now, come on, son. Stay out of this, Dad. Clark, I think it's best if everyone just goes home before things get worse. Worse? How could they get any worse? Take a look around you, Ellen. We're at the threshold of hell.